On the other hand, if I was studying temperature within the plot, it is virtually impossible to get all measures of temperature inside a plot because you can go to the infinite smaller scale and you still can measure temperature. So for the surface pattern, we don't need complete surveys. We do not. Oops. Instead, we need to capture how variable that phenomenon is in the right scale of analysis or in the domain that I'm studying. So if I'm studying South America, I don't need to go to every single centimeter in South America to measure temperature. But I do need a relatively good sample spread across the continent. So in point pattern spatial analysis, what we want to do is to evaluate the spatial relationship between occurrences of events. For in surface pattern, we want to study the variation of a phenomenon that is continuous across space. And it does not require complete surveys. Oh, that means gaps are allowed. I can measure temperature here, and then another one in downtown Cape Town, and then another one in Cape Point, and it can still be a good description of, of how temperature vary in space, right? So if you're gonna do any uh, field work with plants and you're gonna study uh, uh, the distribution of individuals in a given uh, domain for plants, you're probably gonna do point pattern spatial analysis. Unfortunately, we will not have time to, to study it today. Instead, we're gonna do uh, surface pattern because we, we assume that biodiversity is a continuous phenomenon. We assume that there is a measure or a potential measure of biodiversity here and there is one over there. So virtually we could measure biodiversity in any place on Earth, right? So this is a continuous process. And my question is, how does it vary across distances? So if I measure biodiversity here, would that be very different from the other side of the mountain? That's a question. Yes. I, I, I have data that I want to use for this particular analysis. I don't know whether it follows point pattern or surface pattern. This is data that was taken in a forest following a grid sampling pattern. Mm -hmm. So there are windows that are selected, six of them to be specific, and now points were taken within each window and sampled. I'll show you the pattern. What I'm not sure of is how complete is complete in sampling, for example. Right. If I have six windows taken across a forest and from each of them there are 16 sampling points, I exactly don't know whether this is complete survey because then the points must be placed in particular locations. Right. So how is this? Where does my data fall? Because at the beginning I was thinking it's point pattern sampling. But then when you bring in an aspect of complete surveys, I don't know whether it's still complete, like every point was taken. And this is soil uh, by diversity data. Right. So I, I am struggling to get a clear difference between point and surface sampling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, um, uh, being a surface pattern or point pattern is it has assumptions about how, it, how the data was collected and, and surveyed. But more, important than, more importantly than that, it's related to what's your question? What, what is the data for? So if you are studying, for example, uh, uh, the distribution of one 
species of plant in those plots. Inside each plot, you must have a complete survey of individuals of that species, right? So complete means inside your plot, you need a census. All individuals are that species. But that only is the case if you want to understand what is the relationship among individuals of that species within plot. That's a point pattern analysis. But if you are serving plots just to get a measure of number of species there are, how many species there are in that particular place, in that particular plot, and then you will compare plots, the comparison is between plots, or you just want to know how many species there are in the region, then you have surface pattern analysis. Then you do not need complete surveys within plot. So what, what did you survey there? Yes, now, in the grid sampling technique, uh, like I said, there are windows. So you create a one by one kilometer area, for example, in this setting. So that becomes a window. Then within that window, 16 random points were selected on a grid following a given pattern. Mm -hmm. And at each of these 16 points, now we laid, um, a, we, we had a sample, a monolith sampling technique. So you create a um, one meter by one meter area and sample. And within this one meter by one meter monolith uh, sampling plot, we counted all the soil biodiversity within all, all the what? Soil biodiversity, earthworms, termites, ants within each of them because this is a mix. Mm -hmm. So that's the data that I have. Mm -hmm. 16 sampling points from each one kilometer square area, right. which forms the window. Right. So I just want to know whether uh, we the objective was to look at how diversity varied across. Uh, an anthropogenetic uh, land gradient mm -hmm. from outside the forest entering up to the interior mm -hmm. of the forest. So what I want to know is that this is point sampling. You don't seem to be implying that it is because then we picked points within survey the whole one kilometer by one kilometer because you're digging down. Okay, so we sampled point 16 across that. So probably it is falling under surface pattern. It is surface pattern because you are interested in the variation between plots. Yes. You, you were interested in how diversity, soil diversity changes across space, right? You are not interested in how one plot is related, uh, what's happening within plots, no. which will be the case of point pattern, right? Okay. Okay. And usually it is the case that when you have a point pattern analysis, Within plot is very, very important, very important. And the events within the plot, they are, they are the result of your survey. So suppose you have a plant distributed in within this plot. You, you don't get to choose where the plant is. It is already there. So you go there and get the information in your GPS, for example. So the coordinate is your information. So usually when the coordinate is your information, it's a point pattern. When a number, a single number that describes the entire plot is your information, it's usually surface pattern. Okay. So maybe I have both. Sorry, this is taking long, but maybe I have both because I also have the GPS points of each of the points. So can and each of the plots? Each of the 16 points in the plot, I have the GPS readings, right. and I have the quantities of the earthworms that I found and all this. True, but you have a single coordinate for each plot, yeah, right? I have. And is that biological, or did you decide where the plot would be? We decided where the plot would be, so it's not probable. So it's not biological. It's, there's no interesting information on the coordinates of plots. Yeah. It could be anywhere else. Instead, if there was a plant there, or an, an individual that you are looking for there, that will be a biological information, right?
essentially compare the two classes are how smooth or not smooth is a continuous surface, the bottom one, surface patterns, versus how clumped, scattered, over dispersed are some event. So the question is, are you looking at the spatial pattern of events, or are you looking at the smoothness of the surface? True. Is that a, an okay summary? It is a pretty good one. I, I'm not sure if the microphone captured it, but it was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is, for example, a diagram showing the distribution of individuals of a given plant inside a 10 meters by 10 meter plot. So what I have set are the corners of the plot. That's artificial. But within these boundaries, I have surveyed all possible individuals of this particular plant or, or animal or, or something. And the way they are distributed within the plot is a biological information that I'm interested in. And for example, I can ask if they tend to be close together, clumped in space, or if they tend to be over dispersed, not clumped in space, they tend to kind of repel Right? So the corners, the plot itself is part of my survey. But not the biological information that says where the individuals are. Okay? This, on the other hand, is a continuous survey, a surface. This is, for example, temperature anomaly on Earth. Conceptually, I could measure that information anywhere I want. And if I, have, if I happen to have a, a survey over here, and it's a regular grid like you have, it doesn't matter. The phenomenon is continuous. I want you to understand how it varies in space, like, you, like, like the data you have, right? So it's not because my data set is made of points that my question is surface pattern, right? It's, it's more about the nature of the phenomenon you are studying and the question you are asking. We also tend to think that memo species richness or species richness of anything is a continuous phenomenon in space. We like to think that. Um, so that I could go anywhere on Earth and ask how many species of mammal live here. So it's a continuous surface. Okay? All right? So today we're going to talk about surface pattern. But you have to keep in mind that there are different spatial analyses that you could use. They're called point pattern. There are methodology for that. And what do we need to do surface pattern spatial analysis? We need basically only three things. Only three. We need a coordinate a spatial reference to each locality and because we are living in this three-dimensional world to measure to locate something in space you need at least two coordinates latitude and longitude and you also need an information that tells you how the phenomenon you have 
happens to be in that particular locality. So for us, we're going to need species richness, which is what we are studying today. So it could be any other variable. It could be temperature. It could be turnover, species turnover. It could be richness of multiple things. It could be any variable. What I'm saying is that you need the x, you need the y, and you need the z variable. Only three things. And it may not look like, but this map over here was made from only three things. Only three information. Information or informations? Pieces of information. Pieces of information. So you only need three variables to make a map. And I hope that by the end of the day today, this will be pretty clear. Because we're going to open a data set, look that there is only three variables, and then make a map. Right? It has to be pretty clear. Um, maps could look pretty. Uh, it could be made in different scales. You could use a fancy GIS program to do that. But what, I, uh, what my plan is for the day is to show you that regardless of how pretty and fancy the map looks like, it's very simple information. It, it although very useful information. Uh, this, for example, is the map of memo richness in South Africa. It means this map shows that for each particular cell, so here I'm looking at a map that has much larger resolution. Uh, for each particular quadrant or each particular square here, the color means how many species live in that particular area. But I also have, for that particular quadrant, the geographic coordinates, lat long, for this particular quad quadrant. Of course, I have the number of mammals living here. And I could also add a bunch of other variables, like what is the temperature there? What is the number of birds there? What is the number of anything? Right? So, in a single data set, you can have multiple variables that describe the same place, the exact same place. So, consider this as a place or a locality, and then for this particular place I can have species richness of multiple things, I can have uh, descriptors of the environment. We're going to do this exercise today. You seem to have a question. <laughs> oh, where I got the data set from? That's a simple answer okay. for my friend Rafael. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get from? Distribution of mammals come from IUCN website. These are uh, extent of occurrence maps mm -hmm. for 260 mammals in South Africa. Good, thank you. That's where I got the data. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in the tutorial of the software SAM, you're going to find dozens of pages explaining how you can build a data set like that using public available data. You can do that for the entire world if you want. For example, this data set for the distribution of mammals, it's worldwide. Um, Rafael has decided to use only South Africa, and he's, he's going to explain the reasons tomorrow. 
but it could be entire Africa. And today we're going to do an exercise in which we're going to add data to this data set. It's not going to be only memo richness. We're going to bring temperature, precipitation, elevation to this data set. Right? So, in the afternoon, I'm going to show you that this map over here is a Excel spreadsheet. It really is. It has cells. Each cell here, I think it has something like 400 cells. This is cell 1, cell 2, cell 3. And each cell has a coordinate, latitude, longitude. It happens to have this unique number, so that you can reference later, but that's useless for, for mapping. And then there is this number of memo richness. And I could keep adding more stuff here, more variables. And for each one, with one single click, I can make a map. I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay? Break?